and Mr. Strilla. Yes, sir. All right, bring the jurors on in. <clears throat> Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. You can all have a seat. Uh, I see bright, smiling faces, so I'm sure that yesterday was a good day. I mentioned to everybody here it was nice that the sun actually came out and we saw some sun for a while, so hopefully you had a good restful day, and now we're ready to resume. Uh, and the state will call their next witness. Thanks, Jeff. Sutan Ward, please. All right, ma'am, if you'll come right up here to the front for me, please. And if you'll raise your right hand, the clerk will administer the oath to you. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. All right, ma'am, if you'll come right around this way and have a seat in the witness chair. You can adjust that microphone as you need and just be sure and speak directly into it and loudly so we can all hear you, all right? Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Guy? Thank you, sir. Good morning, ma'am. If you'd please tell the members of the jury your name. Good morning. My name is Sakan Worf. That's spelled S-U-K-H-A-N, Worf, W-A-R-F. And where are you employed? I work for the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. We have a laboratory here in Jacksonville, and I work in the biology section of that laboratory. All right, and that's known as FDLE as well? Yes. How long have you been working for FDLE? For 11 years. And what are your duties and responsibilities in the biology DNA section? I work well, in the biology section. We take in items of evidence and screen them for their potential for the DNA testing process. So I look for body fluids and I, I um, examine items to see if there are potential sources for touch or wearer DNA. And then I also perform the DNA testing on those items. And how long have you worked in the biology section? I've worked in the biology section since I've been employed for, at FDLA for 11 years. What is forensic serology? Forensic serology is the study of bodily fluids as it pertains to forensic cases. All right, you mentioned that you conduct DNA testing. What specific type of DNA testing do you conduct? The type of DNA testing we perform at the laboratory here in Jacksonville is called um, short tandem repeat or STR DNA testing. Um, it's DNA testing that is targeting DNA that is in the nucleus or the center of cells. And how long have you been conducting STR DNA analysis? I've been doing that for eight years. Give the jury an idea of your educational background, please. I attended the University of North Florida here in Jacksonville. I got a bachelor's degree in biology. And then I also went up to, on to obtain from the University of Florida a Master of Science in Forensic DNA and Serology. Have you also received training within uh, FDLE uh, to perform your duties as a forensic serologist? Yes, I have. The, Can you just go ahead and describe that training if you would? FDLE has a very in-depth training program in which I will do initially an academic study of the test and processes that I will be later performing. And I will do testing samples, so I'll, I'll run um, samples and uh, at the end of that period, there is an oral board examination. And then there is a period of supervised casework. So I'm working actual casework under somebody else's supervision for a period of time until I'm released to do cases on my own. All right. Have you ever been qualified in the courts of the state of Florida as an expert in the fields of forensic serology and serology with an expertise in STR DNA testing? Yes, I have. Approximately how many times? I've testified approximately 40 times in Northeast Florida. Judge, I would at this time tender Ms. Worf as an expert in the field of forensic serology with an expertise in STR DNA testing. Mr. Strola, any objections? All right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Ms. Worf uh, is declared to be an expert in the field of forensic, forensic uh, serology. And her testimony is like any other witness with one exception, and that is the law permits an expert witness to give his, or in this case, her opinion. 
However, an expert's opinion is reliable only when given on a subject about which you believe he or she is actually an expert. Like any other witness, you may believe or disbelieve all or any part of an expert's testimony. That's one of the instructions I'll give you at the close of the case, that you can believe or disbelieve all or any part of any witness's testimony. You're the, the, uh, the judge, so to speak, of what the facts of the case are. So she's declared to be an expert in this field. Mr. Guy? Thank you, sir. Ms. Worf, what is DNA and how can it be used in a forensic setting? DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, and it's found within the cells of your bodies. Now, DNA, everybody's DNA is unique with the exception of identical twins. It is the building blocks of who we are. It makes us who we are. Now, most of our DNA between individuals is the same because that's what makes us human. Um, so the DNA that I'm interested in is the DNA that is different, that makes us individuals, that makes us unique because that's what's important in the forensic setting because the purpose of the DNA in the forensic setting is for identification. And what is commonly referred to now as touch DNA? What, what does that mean? Well, DNA can come from anything a person has had contact with. So the term touch DNA is just anything somebody may have touched versus getting DNA from a biological fluid. And can you explain how DNA is transferred from a person to an object to create what is known as touch DNA? Sure. Uh, the DNA is found in most of the cells of our bodies. It's found in the skin cells that is on our hands. So if we touch an item um, or come in contact with our skin to an item, it has the potential to leave behind DNA from those skin cells. All right, and you said potential, and that's kind of my follow-up question. Just because a person touches a surface or an object, does it mean that they will leave their DNA behind? No. Touch DNA uh, often doesn't leave much DNA behind. That's why we screen things for biological fluids, because they are good sources of DNA. So touch DNA may leave DNA behind, but it doesn't always. All right. If you had a surface that you wanted to test for touch DNA, how would you do that? How would, how would it be collected? Um, a swab would be taken, which, you know, it resembles a Q-tip kind of cotton swab, will be rubbed on the item, and then when I do my analysis, I will take a cutting from that swab to do the testing on. All right. Have you had an opportunity to examine some evidence in the case of the state of Florida versus Michael Dunn, FDLE number 2012-406-772? Yes. You know, may I approach the witness? Yes, sir. Let me hand you what's been marked as stage 197 and ask you to examine the packaging as well as the contents of that exhibit. Do you recognize that? Yes, I do. And what do you recognize that to be? This was an item that was received from the laboratory that was described to be um, a swab from 9 millimeter casings. And was that exhibit sealed when you received it? Yes, it was. And is that important? Yes, it is. Why is that important? Well, it's very important to maintain the integrity of the evidence. So the item being sealed initially um, is very important. It's important that we maintain a chain of custody where this item was at all points in time um, to, to maintain the quality and te integrity of the evidence itself. All right. Did you examine that exhibit for the presence of DNA? Yes, I did. All right. How did you do that? Well, there was a swab, so I took a cutting from the swab, and then I subjected it to the DNA testing process. All right, can you kind of open that up and pull out the swab and just kind of show the jurors what you're talking about and, and where you've marked on that exhibit? I think one end is already open. Thank you. This was the inner container that was inside of the outer manila envelope that I received. So inside this is a swab. It looks a lot like a Q-tip that I took the cutting from for the DNA testing process. All right. And what did you find when you examined that swab for the presence of DNA? Well, I did the DNA testing process on it, and my results were I did not obtain any detectable DNA on this. All right. Does that mean that that casing, whatever the swab was taken from, was never touched by human hands? No, that's not what it means. Um, it, 
it could be what that means, um, but it could also mean that there just wasn't enough DNA for me to detect. Getting no results on a casing is a common occurrence. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Your Honor, that's all I have. Mr. Stroll. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Ms. Forf, how are you doing this morning? Well. Now, you said you're an expert in the DNA serology. Is that correct? The DNA, the SDR DNA testing and um, DNA serology, yes. What we call forensic serology. Yes. Okay, and that's what you've been qualified as an expert before? Forensic serology and DNA testing. Okay, and no forensic serology was done in this case, correct? That's correct, because it was a touch uh, sample uh, and it had already been swabbed as well. There was no serology or screening test done on this. Right, and no bodily fluids were ever presented to, for you to test? That's, that's correct. Okay, just shell casings? That's right. Okay, and you said it's not uncommon for it not to have touch DNA on it, correct? That's correct. And even though you did short tandem testing, your office can do Y short tandem, but that wouldn't have applied to this case either, correct? This sample was, it, it did not meet the criteria to go forward with Y STR DNA testing, Y being a male specific uh, DNA test. Okay, and there are other DNA testings that could have been done, but either your office doesn't do it or it wouldn't even be relevant to this case. Is that accurate? There are other DNA testing in existence. For example, there's mitochondrial DNA, which tested, tests DNA from mitochondria of cells, which is a different part of, se of the cell. Um, but that would not uh, be appropriate for this sample either. Okay. And again, you said you have a master's, is that correct? I do. Okay. No PhD, no doctorate, nothing like that yet? N no. Okay. And you're not a technical leader in your lab? I am not. You're just an analyst, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And, <coughs> excuse me, they gave you a lot more samples. The sheriff's office had sent in to you a lot more samples to be tested for DNA in this case. Isn't that true? Yes, that's right. And you made the professional judgment to not test them. Isn't that accurate? That's right. There were three more items that were received for in the biology section that I did not test. And that was shell casings recovered from the suspect vehicle, a top of the magazine touch from the suspect vehicle, and then live rounds that were in the magazine in the suspect vehicle. Is that correct? That's right. And you didn't test those because it's kind of obvious. If it's in someone's vehicle, it's probably going to have their DNA on it. It's not that it's probably going to have their DNA on it, but even if it did have their DNA, DNA on it, it was represented as coming from the suspect's vehicle. And our purpose at the lab is to tie people together or to tie them to a scene. So something in a person's own possession doesn't seem to help. And do you recall getting a phone call from Detective Musser asking you why you didn't test anything from the suspect's vehicle? Well, it was kind of compound, so it is sustained. Let me ask you this. At some point, did somebody reach out to you from the sheriff's office to ask you about your findings? Yes. Okay. And based on that conversation, did you kind of explain to that person just what you did now? It's not relevant because it came from inside the vehicle. Yes, I did. Okay. Nothing further, Judge. Thank you, Ms. Ward. May she be excused? Uh, Mr. Stroll? So excuse, Judge, yes. Thank you, ma'am. You're excused. Yes. State's next witness. Maria Pagan. She's in the room. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Pagan, if you'll come forward, please. All the way up to the front here, the clerk will have you uh, take an oath if you'd raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Thank All you. All right, if you'll come right around and have a seat for me, please. And be sure to speak loudly into the microphone so everybody can hear you. Ms. Corey, go right ahead. Yes, Your Honor. State your name for the record. It's Maria Pagan. That's P-A-G-A-N. What is your profession? I work for the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. I'm a crime laboratory analyst in the firearms section. How long have you been with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement? Um, it has been almost seven years. What is your educational background? 
I have a bachelor's degree in psychology, and I have a bachelor's degree in forensic science with a chemistry minor. What was your training to become a firearms analyst? Um, I have approximately um, two years of training in, in house at the Florida Department of Law Enforcement in firearms identification. And have you attended seminars in that same genre? Yes, part of our training includes different seminars, training courses, practicals, things such as that. Do you engage in personal study on your own to aid you in your position with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement? Yes, we have plenty of um, access to plenty of resources. Are you a member of any professional associations? No. What are your current duties at FDLE? What actually do you look at in your capacity as a firearms analyst? Right. Um, as a firearms an analyst, I process firearms and firearms related evidence. Um, the most common thing that we do, what we're typically doing, is uh, processing the, the firearms themselves to make sure that they function properly. So we test fire them to see if they're in working order. We also um, look at fired components, that would be fired bullets and fired cartridge cases. Those are the components that um, result when someone uh, fires a, um, a shot. And we, can, we try to determine whether or not the bullets or the cartridge cases were fired from a given gun. Or if we don't have a gun, we try to determine if bullets or cartridge cases all came from the same gun. Um, and that's our primary duties. We also do a few other things like serial number restorations, and we process clothing also for bullet holes. Have you ever qualified and then been declared an expert in firearms identification in the courts of the state of Florida? Yes, I have. How many times? It's been approximately 55, 60 times. Having been declared an expert in firearms in those same courts in this state, have you gone on to be able to give a jury your opinion in firearms identification? Yes, I have. Okay. How many times? Again, approximately 55, 60 times. Your Honor, at this time I would tender Ms. Pagan to the jury as an expert in firearms and ammunition identification. Mr. Schroeder? All right, ladies and gentlemen, the same instruction uh, holds for Ms. Pagan, that is that she's declared to be an expert in the area of firearms identification and ammunition uh, identification, and so she will be able to render an opinion about uh, that subject matter. Are there numerous types and calibers of handguns? Yes, there are. Can you explain the difference between a revolver and a pistol, or specifically a semi-automatic? Well, with a revolver, um, it's a manual gun. I think most people are familiar with how revolvers have um, a cylinder in them, and you manually load the cartridges into the, the round cylinder um, so that each time when you fire, the, uh, when you pull the trigger, the hammer will, will pull back if you haven't already pulled it back manually. Um, you pull the trigger, the hammer will fall, and with each pull of the trigger, the, the cylinder will rotate and it will shift to the next unfired cartridge. And then you can fire until, obviously, you've spent all of your cartridges, you've fired all your bullets. At that point, the user then has to manually push the cylinder out, take out the fired cartridges, the ones that aren't good anymore, um, remove them, and reload the firearm. With a semi-automatic, you have a magazine, which the user lo can load with cartridges. You place the cartridge into the well, uh, to the magazine well of the pistol. With each pull of the trigger, the, um, the gun fires, the slide will automatically cycle, the, the power from the explosion automatically cycles the slide and will feed a new fresh cartridge. It will pull out and extract and eject the old cartridge automatically. And then when it shuts, it will feed a new fresh cartridge, a new bullet, um, so that with each, with each pull of the trigger, one shot will be fired, um, extracted, ejected, and a new cartridge will be fed. Let me ask you, ma'am, to explain the different parts of a whole cartridge or a bullet. Right. Um, what most people call, most people will call them bullets, but they're technically called a cartridge. A cartridge consists of three main, three or four main components. You'll, you'll have, you have a, like a, you have a, bra a brass cup uh, that makes the base, and inside the brass cup, that's where the gunpowder goes in, and then on top of the brass cut, cup um, fits in kind of snugly is the bullet. And then on the a very bottom of the cup is a small metal disc that's embedded on the bottom, and that's called a primer. That's the highly sensitive material that um, when the hammer or the pin hits it, that's what actually starts the ignition the explosion. So you've got your brass cup, your bullet on top, your gunpowder inside, and then your primer on the bottom. 
If I ask you about a 9 millimeter cartridge, tell the jurors to what the 9 millimeter refers. Um, that's in reference to its approximate caliber, which means the approximate diameter of the bullet or the, the bore of the gun that it can be shot out of. And is that considered to be small caliber, medium caliber, or large caliber ammunition? That would be about a, a medium to large caliber. It's not a small caliber. How far can a Taurus 9mm semi-automatic weapon fire if there's nothing to obstruct the bullet? Well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to continue to travel it, um, until it hits something, um, or unless it runs out of momentum. I'm not sure exactly how far that would be, but it, it's a good distance. It's not just a few, it's not just a few yards. It's, you're, you're looking at several hundred yards probably before it would, um, but it would start to lose power at some point. Yes, ma'am. What happens specifically when the shell casing, what happens specifically to the shell casing when a semi-automatic pistol is fired? So when, when the gun is fired, uh, the explosion occurs. That's what, um, that pressure buildup is what pushes the bullet out of the muzzle, and that will travel in the forward direction. The cartridge case is, um, so if the, if the gun is pointing that way, the bullet will go that way. The cartridge case stays inside the gun temporarily, and it is actually forced in the opposite direction. So the bullet goes that way, and the cartridge case is going to slam against the inside of the gun. That's what provides the momentum to automatically cycle the gun. It will slam against the inside surfaces as well as get a little fatter. It will obdurate um, and slam against the surface, push the slide back, which then starts the process, process of extracting that spent cartridge case and ejecting it out of the gun. Is there a certain ejection pattern for certain types of semi-automatic pistols? Whether they eject to the left, the right, forward, or backwards? Right. Most semi-automatic pistols are usually designed to eject in the, to the right side. Um, that each pistol, though, could, can be different. Um, some pistols might not even be consistent within of themselves, but you can get a variety. But in general, semi-automatic pistols are typically designed to eject to the right, some of them up the top, but normally to the right. Is an ejected or spent casing fairly light in weight? Um, yes, they're not, they're not he I wouldn't say they were heavy. And if there is an outdoor shooting scene where vehicles can pull up, rescue units, et cetera, would you expect that those types of things, just even driving by, like a vehicle driving by, could scatter spent shell casings? Yes, they have been known to be scattered or kicked around and whatnot. Does the fact that a bullet passes through an object, whether human or inanimate, have an effect on how pristine the projectile will be? Yes, it can. And tell the jurors, um, can you give them basically an example of being able to fire a 9 millimeter bullet and have it in its most pristine condition, for example, in your lab conditions. Explain that to them for me. Right. In our lab, obviously, when we test fire a gun and if we're trying to recover a bullet that we can use to compare to an evidence bullet, we want that bullet to be in very good condition. So we test fire we, um, into a large water tank, a large sealed water tank, so that the water quickly slows the bullet down without damaging it. Um, because typically, obviously, when most bullets, when they hit something, depending on the hardness, obviously, of what they hit, there's a great chance of deformation and damage. Now, does a bullet that passes through metal, for example, a vehicle, have a greater chance of becoming deformed or fragmented? Greater than yes, as if, uh, greater than if they had fired it in a water tank, yes. Um, and it also depends on the type of bullet. Some of the bullets are hollow pointed, which actually, which would make them more likely to expand or expand in different ways um, or, or be damaged in different ways. So it, the type of ammunition also plays a role. Are there times when a bullet becomes so fragmented that you cannot even attempt to identify it to yes. a particular weapon? Yes, and that's explain correct. why to the jury. Um, if there, there's a lot of damage, when we're uh, comparing bullets to each other, what we're looking for is as the bullet travels down the barrel, it rubs, I get, you can say it, it rubs or is in contact with the inside surface of the barrel, which puts striations along the body of the bullet. And we're actually looking at these striations and comparing them to each other to see if there's, a, if there's correspondence between the types of marks that we're getting on the bullet. If there's damage or deformation, those those striations can be wiped 
can be scrubbed over, they can be wiped off, they can be twisted and distorted in such a way that they're not of any value anymore or we can't even visualize them at all. Let me take you specifically, ma'am, to the facts of this case. Are notes made when you're conducting your firearms analysis of any given piece of evidence? Yes. And are those no notes kept in the normal course of your business at the Florida Department of Law Enforcement? Yes, they are. Are those notes then put into an official report that is maintained by the Florida Department of Law Enforcement and then furnished to um, law enforcement agencies and to the state attorney's office? Yes. Is there a specific case number assigned to any given case? Yes. And are all reports kept by FDLE kept under that same number? Yes, they are. And would it aid you in your testimony today to be able to refer to that report if you so need? Yes. Okay. Did you examine evidence related to the shooting death of Jordan Davis? Yes, I did. At whose request did you examine the evidence in this case? At the, crest, um, at the request of the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. When a law enforcement officer brings items of physical evidence to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement for purposes of having you all look at them, do you call that a submission? Yes, we do. And can there be multiple submissions depending on when the police gather certain types of evidence? Yes, that's correct. On what dates were items of physical evidence submitted to your department and requested that your firearms section review them? We received evidence on December 6, 2012 and on December 18, 2012. Please explain to the jury the Florida Department of Law Enforcement procedures for storing evidence until an expert such as yourself can take custody of it for testing. Yes, when the agency brings in the evidence, it's submitted to our evidence section. They take the evidence and give it its proper um, number and uh, case number and exhibit number. It is then placed into a secure vault that has limited access. Um, at that point, I'm notified, I'm assigned the case, and when I go down to pick up evidence, I'll go down to our evidence section, which is by the vault. I'll give them the case number that I need, and they will retrieve the evidence and, and transfer it and put it in my name. And at that point, it's in my custody. Thank you. Your Honor, may I move to our front table if I promise to wear one of those little microphones? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Regas, so speak to make it move along. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. I'm going to start by showing you States Exhibit 188 and ask you, ma'am, in States 188, are these the types of fragments we've just described that are very difficult to try to identify? Yes, they are. Purposes? And if you could, can you, uh, may she, Your Honor, get up by me? Yes, ma'am. Could you come here, Ms. Pagan? Can you just show the jury why you would never be able to identify those two pieces? Well, here, um, we have actually two different types of fragments. This appears to be this, uh, a red alloy fragment Bullets often consist of a lead core, and then they'll have a metal jacket around them. So when they're fired, it's that metal jacket that's actually in contact with the inside of the barrel. So if I have a, a core with no jacket, it's not going to have those marks on it that I need for uh, identification. So automatically, the, the lead core, I'm not going to have any value as far as it can be identified with a specific gun. And here we have a, a jacket fragment. Would you mind, please, step over here, but keep your voice up for and, our court reporter. Or okay. maybe you can what give would you her do? another one of those little... I'll, I'll... That's fine. All right, and the one here on the... That would be your right. Uh, that's a, a jacket fragment. Um, but it's, it's pretty small, and it's largely damaged, as well as uh, turned in on itself, so it's not likely that any of the marks that were there would be either visible or viable, uh, or it lessens the chances that, that it would be uh, useful. Stay right there, and I'm going to show you one more item of evidence that's been entered as State's Exhibit 189 and ask you, are those representative also of items that you cannot identify? 
Um, again, it's kind of the same thing. I, I, I can't say for sure unless I was to actually look at them under a microscope whether they would be of value, but they are highly damaged and distorted. So again, that would lessen the chances that they would be of value for identification. And just could you just walk this particular exhibit in front of the jury and we can resume the stand for right now? Ms. Pagal, are there times when an even more substantial piece of lead that's been fired from a gun still cannot be identified completely? Yes, there are times we get a we can get bullets that look pretty much intact without much damage, but they might they might not be marked well. Um, certain some guns mark really well, and other guns do not mark well. So sometimes it doesn't matter if there's a lot of damage or not. Some guns just do not mark bullets well well enough to be used for identification. We take a look at them, look at what kind of marks are there, see if we can find anything, but it just varies from gun to gun. All right. Let me begin, ma'am, by showing you State's Exhibit 186 and asking you to refer to your report and tell me, is this one of the items, which would be JSO Submission 1, Item 2, that you reviewed for your purposes? Yes, it is. Okay. And in looking at that one under a microscope, were you able to either identify or eliminate that as having been fired from the gun that was submitted to you? No, I was not. And tell the jurors what your findings that you may neither eliminate nor identify that particular piece mean. Um, it means that this gun may or may not have been fired from this particular firearm, that I was not able to come to a conclusion. And that is one of the items that you showed the jurors earlier with the attributes uh, that you could not actually be able to, um, to, to look for those little ridges and details that you described. Is that correct? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if I understand what you're asking. When I, showed, when I had you show that to the jury earlier and you showed them parts of that, is it missing that type of ridge detail you would need to be able to come to a more definite conclusion sure. about that? Um, I did find that, that this um, jacket, this is a bullet jacket, that neither the bu this bullet jacket nor the tests that I fired myself into the water tank, the tests weren't marked very well. Um, this wasn't marked very well. Uh, so this would be one of the cases where it's a gun that just doesn't mark bullets very well. And it can also be a function of the type of ammunition that's, that's being used. But this gun did not appear to mark bullets very well. And so it would be very difficult to identify bullets that were, in my opinion, it'd be very difficult to identify bullets that were fired from this gun to that gun. All right. Thank you, ma'am. Were there other items that you could not identify even though they appeared to be as large as the one I've just shown you. Yes, I had two other bullets submitted. Um, right. And I, sh I should probably note that in the barrel, there are grooves cut out in the barrel in a twist so that it imparts spin onto the bullet. Um, this particular gun had uh, six grooves cut into it, and they had a right twist. And, and those grooves are also a certain width. Um, and I did find that the bullets that were submitted to me, the bullets and the jacket that submitted to me, did have the correct amount of uh, grooves and twists. They were both six grooves, right twist, and they were a compatible um, width, similar width. So the class, we call those class characteristics because it is possible for other guns to have six grooves with a right twist of a similar width, um, but it does help narrow down uh, for instance, if these had had five grooves on them and my gun had six grooves, then I could automatically eliminate it. So the, the class characteristics of the bullets and, and jacket matched. Um, however, I was not able to, again, I could not identify it as being fired in that gun or eliminate it as having been fired in that gun. And let me ask you to assume the following facts for, for purposes of the question I will ask you. Assume that this bullet, the two bullets I'm about to show you, were fired through a vehicle 
and into a human body. My question to you, looking at state's exhibit, and then recovered, of course, from the medical examiner's office. Would states 190 and 192 fit the type of examination you just described? Yes. Okay. And submission to JSO's number, submission to item two, recovered from the medical examiner's office, were you able to identify this bullet as having been fired from the Taurus that you examined? No, it was the same as the, the jacket. I could neither identify nor eliminate. All right. States 192 in evidence, and I believe that one was 190 if I made a mistake. The first one's 190, now I'm showing her 192, and ask you the same questions, ma'am. This was recovered from the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office from the medical examiner. Were you able to eliminate or identify that as having been fired from the Taurus? No, I was not. Okay. Thank you. I have just a second to get these back, Judge. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Were there further items of evidence that you did in this case? Yes, there were. When you referred to these particular three bullets that we've just described, or the pieces of the bullets, you called them 9mm, 38, or 357 caliber class metal jackets. Why would they have three types of categories for one particular bullet? Um, those, are, those are all actually in reference um, to the diameter. Those three they're all in the same caliber class family, which is the 38, which means it's um, 0.354 inches. The 9 millimeter, the 38, and the 357 are just um, class designations. That's just what they call the cartridge when it's all put together. But the diameter of all those different bullets of the 38 Special, of the 357 Magnum, um, cartridge of the 9mm Luger cartridge, those, the diameter of the bullet itself is all the same diameter. So, because I have a bullet, but no cartridge, I, um, just the, when, when you're referring to just a bullet, you can't always narrow it down uh, to just 9mm based on the weight and the diameter, because it's possible to have that same diameter in other uh, cartridges. All right. Ms. Pagan, did you examine five 9mm shell casings that were recovered from the scene, Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, Submission 1, Item 1? Yes, I did. Those? Let me show you now what's been entered into evidence as States 185. And may she step down from the stand, Your Honor? Yes, ma'am. Would you come down here, please, ma'am? If you can get her to use that mic as best you can. Is there another one we could put on her? May I have just a Should second, Your Honor? Yep. <coughs> you can put it to your sir if you don't mind. And, because I do have several other things to show her, sir. Okay. Okay. Ms. Pagan, could you first please display by walking this in front of the jury these five 9mm shell casings? Okay. These are the brass cups that hold the... Um, gunpowder of a cartridge. Were you able, and turn back towards the jury, Ms. Simpkins, can you hear us both? Were you able to identify those five 9mm shell casings recovered from the gate gas station as having been fired from the Taurus pistol that you examined? Yes, I did. I identified them as having been fired in this pistol in this case. Let me show you now, ma'am, State's Exhibit 194. I'm going to need this whole thing thing over here. Judge, may we bring this table? Yes, ma'am. And I need you to unlock it for me. Can you get the shell casings out for me? 194. This is a composite exhibit, State's 194, and I'm going to ask you, ma'am, did you look at the Taurus 9mm pistol that's contained herein. Yes, I did. Did you also look at the um, five 9mm Luger cartridges that are in here? Yes, I did. And then there is a spent, one lone spent cartridge case that was recovered from the floorboard of Mr. Dunn's vehicle. Did you examine that for evidence as well? Yes. Okay. Is it open? Okay. Judge, 
Mr. Rupert, or Officer Rupert has opened this and the gun still is uh, safe with the strap through it. May I open it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. Thank you. No, I'm sorry. I actually didn't look. I wasn't submit, um, given the unfired cartridges. The unfired cartridges, yeah, but they were it. with the gun. Or you never, you didn't look at these particular unfired cartridges. Is that correct? Right. They weren't okay. submitted to me. But the shell casing was. Yes. The okay. The fire then let's yes. pull this out. No, it goes right on top. Grab that in for me. Set it right on top of that box. And Ms. Pagan, let's start first with that shell casing. This slides right out of here. And I'm going to ask you, that cartridge case found on the front floorboard of Mr. Dunn's vehicle, were you able to positively identify that as having been fired from this semi-automatic weapon? Yes, I did. And how were you able to do that? As I mentioned earlier, when the trigger's pulled and the gun fires, there's the explosion that happens. Uh, the bullet goes in one direction. This cartridge case that had the gunpowder in it slams, uh, goes in the other direction and slams against the inside surfaces of the gun. When it slams against those surfaces, it's impressed with the characteristics of the surface of the gun. And by using a microscope, a comparison microscope, we're able to look at uh, this cartridge case. I would look at it side by side. Um, with one of the cartridge cases that I fired myself from the gun when I test fired it. And I look at the marks that are on the two cartridge cases in, uh, to see if they have enough correspondence for an identification. All right. And you can put that right back in there for me. Thank you. And one last exhibit, uh, submission six, item 11, recovered, four casings recovered from a Jetta at the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office Warehouse. This is States 196. And ma'am, did you examine those four shell casings to see whether or not you could match them to this semi-automatic weapon? Yes, I did. And what was your conclusion on that? I identified them to this gun. Okay. Thank you. And now I'm going to ask you, ma'am, um, to look at the holster. does have a dowel through it, so let me pull that out. And I'll ask you to look at the firearm itself. Can you show the jurors, even with the strap on, I think you can. Does it fit down into that holster? All right. Yes. Is there any strap on that holster that keeps that weapon inside? In other words, causing a shooter one extra step before they can get it out of the holster? No. Okay. Um, and is that holster intact? Is there anything wrong with that holster itself? Um, it appears to be intact. Yes. Okay. Now, let me ask you to look at the magazine. And I think this slides out. I'm going to hand you that. Do some people commonly refer to this as a clip? Yes. Can you tell the jurors its technical name, obviously? Technically, it's called a magazine. Okay. And then um, can you show the jurors the, how the bullets are loaded into the magazine? And I'll hold the weapon for you, please. Um, as you can see, there is what we call a, a, it's a follower. It's plastic. It's on top there. And that this is spring-loaded, so there's a spring throughout the body. Um, you load the cartridges here at the top one by one, and as you load them, the follower and spring will be pushed down. Um, and it gives it enough pressure so that when you're using it in the gun, um, when the slide moves back, the, the, unspent, the unfired cartridge will pop up so that when the slide moves forward, it will shear it off the top and feed it into the gun. All right, and we're not going to put the magazine into the gun, but I want you to pretend for purposes of your demonstration to the jury that a magazine is in there. Show them what you mean by the fact that a bullet comes from the top of this magazine and enters the chamber of the gun. Again, if, there, if you can imagine there was a magazine in here, um, when the gun is fired, the trigger is pulled, the bullet exits, the cartridge case slams against the inside, pushes this slide backwards in this manner, um, and you can see the hole there, that's the magazine well. That's where the magazine will be sticking up um, with the unspent cartridge. Um, so the unspent cartridge will be here at approximately this location. So as the slide moves back forward, it's going to strip the unspent cartridge and feed it into the barrel. Um, as the slide is, again, as when I fire it and the slide moves backwards, this little prong here pulls out the spent cartridge case, the one that was just fired, 
pulls it backwards, and there's another little ob um, pointy object on the inside that it pulls it backwards, hits that pointy object, kicks out the spent one, and then at this point, it's ready to feed the new one as it closes. What is the capacity of the magazine that's connected with, to that gun? It's right there. You put it on the jury box. Do you need to look at your notes? Um, yes. Let me double check. Okay. Can you get those in? It's 15. I'm sorry. It's 15. 15. Now, is there a way for the shooter or the, the person handling this gun to give themselves one extra bullet? Um, yes, they can. Before they put the magazine in, they could pull this back, lock it, put a, put a cartridge in there, an unfired cartridge in there manually, allow it to close, and then put the magazine in. So you'll have your 15 in your magazine and then one already in the chamber. Okay. And is that what we commonly refer to as having a chamber, a round chamber? Yes, chambered. Does yes. it make it easier to fire to go ahead and have a round in the chamber? Um, it takes one less step. If, if you don't have a, a round in the chamber, you have to manually pull the slide back and load a cartridge. Okay. Did you check this semi-automatic Taurus for function? Yes, I did. And was there anything wrong with the function of this gun? Um, let me double check. Can I? Uh, do I yes. Need? And may she bring her notes down here, Judge? Sure. Have several questions and demonstrations for the jury. Uh -huh. Yes. Okay, thank you. No, I'm sorry. I didn't need them. I needed to make sure you put them back. Uh, show them just in there. Okay. I'm sorry, what was the last question? Okay, my last question was, did you find anything at all faulty with the function of this semi-automatic weapon? Um, the, the firearm did function. The only uh, problem that I found with it was uh, one of the safety functions didn't quite operate like it normally would. Um, but you could, it was the thumb, the thumb safety. You could put it in safe position. You just had, it didn't operate as smoothly as it normally would. Tell the jurors what a safety feature is. Um, a safety feature is a feature that the manufacturer puts into the gun to help prevent accidental shootings typically or to make the gun more safe to carry uh, and, again, to prevent people from accidentally shooting themselves or other people or whatnot. Without um, being right there on scene and watching a shooter, would you know whether or not they had the safety on or off prior to shooting? No. Okay. How many safeties are there on this particular firearm? Um, this firearm, it has a thumb safety it, and it has two internal safeties called firing pin block and it has a hammer intercept notch. Okay. Do you consider the handle, the grip of this pistol to be fairly large or is it typical for that nine millimeter Taurus? Um, it's, for me being, perhaps because I'm a female, I feel it's a little large, um, but it would again depend on the person who's using it, obviously. What does it mean to fire this Taurus double action? Double action is when, the best, the best way to explain it probably is to show you. Um, single action mode is when the user pulls the hammer back so that it's in cocked position like it is now. If I pull it back myself or use the slide to pull it back and now it's in this position and I pull the trigger, that's called single action because the trigger is just doing one thing. It's dropping the hammer. But if I don't pull the hammer back manually and I don't use the slide to pull it back, if the hammer's already down um, and I was to pull the trigger and the trigger cocks the hammer and releases the hammer, that's called double action mode. Does that affect the trigger pull when the shooter decides whether to fire it double action or single action? Yes, that will affect the force that's required um, on the trigger to have it to have it, uh, the trigger pull and fall, and the hammer fall. And what does it mean to fire this gun single action? Again, single that. action would be if I manually cock the hammer or pull the hammer, um, cock the hammer with the slide. Okay. Um, and if you presume that the safety was on while this pistol was holstered, is that yet another step the shooter would have to take to get the gun in a ready to fire position? Yes, it, it is. Okay. Um, did you test fire this pistol? Yes, I did. Tell the jurors what type of test you performed. 
when I first receive the gun, I visually inspect it and see if it appears to be functioning properly, if it appears to be safe. Um, I also will dry fire it and again, see if it, uh, it appears to be functioning properly. Um, at that point, if I deem it safe to test fire it, I take it into the range and I'll fire a couple shots um, into the water tank and then I'll retrieve the bullets that I fired and the spent cartridge cases and those will be what I use to make my comparisons. Did you make note of in which direction the shell casings ejected from this firearm? No, I did not. Okay. Did you make note that the shell casings do eject from this firearm? Yes, I don't believe I had them. No, it's okay Sorry. if you don't know direction, but do they eject and fly outside of the gun when it's fired? Um, yes, I didn't note that I had any problems with uh, the ejection. Okay, and can you give the jury a common example of what trigger pull means for, for a human being's finger? Um, well, it's referring, again, to the amount of force, the amount of, that is required to pull the trigger back. So if the trigger pull is about six pounds, you're looking at uh, six pounds of pressure on that trigger in the backwards direction. So it would be like pushing something that weighs six pounds backwards towards you. What is the trigger pull of this Taurus 9mm when fired single action? In single action, it was approximately six and a quarter pounds. What is the trigger pull of this Taurus 9mm when fired double action? Double action is approximately 13 pounds. Once a round is chambered into this pistol, does the shooter still have to pull the trigger with at least 6.25 pounds of pull for each round fired? Yes, approximately. So if 10 shots have been fired from this specific pistol, does that mean with each shot it's 6.25 pounds to pull that trigger? Again, yes, approximately. And does that differ from a fully automatic weapon where you pull the trigger once and the shots just keep going? That's correct, yes. So does this take a conscious effort of the shooter to, to have that second bullet come out? I would say so. You have, to, you have to activate your finger each time. Okay. And a third bullet? Yes, for each, for each fire, you have to pull that trigger. All the way up to 10 bullets? Yes, however many is our fire. All right. You can resume the stand, please, ma'am. Judge, I have no further questions for Ms. Pagan. Mr. Stroller. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Yes, sir. It's right there. Um, I'm fine, thank you. Did I hear you say that safety? And you can leave that right there, Angela. Can you come back down for me? Sure. Can you take the gun and put it back in the holster for me? Slide it in the best you can. I know there's some <coughs> zip ties on there. You have it in backwards. All right. And that would actually go in even further, but the zip tie is on there, correct? Probably, yes. I would oh. think so. Okay. And again, you're an expert in handling these, correct? Yes. You, you, sure. You've done this your whole career. Yes, I've handled many guns. So to show the jury right now, this is not how it would sit inside that holster because of the way it's packaged from the state. Is that correct? Right. It would be going in a bit further. Okay. So in fact, you can actually see an outline of the trigger guard right here on the holster, correct? Yes, that's correct. So that means it would go all the way in. Would you agree with that? Um, yes, I would. Okay. So isn't it true if that wasn't packaged for the state this way, you would never be able to file that gun while it's in the holster because you couldn't get your finger on the trigger. True? Um, I'm not sure I wouldn't be able to say that unless I saw it in there. Okay. I can't tell if you'd be able to slip your finger in there or not. But the way you can see the trigger guard is... I can see it. The trigger guard, I would think that you probably couldn't. But again, unless I actually saw it in there, I couldn't say for sure. Okay, and again, this is because it's packaged by the state this way. Yes, because it has this zip tie, which kind of keeps me from pushing it all the way in. Okay, and then do me a favor. Tell the jury, what is the manufacturer's trigger pull poundage on that firearm? Um, I'm not sure what the manufacturer has listed as its trigger pull. Tell me what year that gun was manufactured. Uh, I believe this was manufactured in 1988. Right. Did you do any research on that gun? Um, I did look that up. Um, usually if we want to know that information, we can go to the manufacturer's website, and often they'll have that information on their specs list. Um, if they don't, we can always try to call the manufacturer to get that information. And you've been on this case since when? I believe I received it December 2012. Okay, and you knew you were coming here to testify, correct? Yes. You knew the state was going to call you as an expert to testify about that gun, correct? Yes. And you didn't look up any of the specifications for your testimony for this jury? Um, just because it's not usually relevant to the case. Uh, I, we find most of the time, though, even though a manufacturer may specify a specific trigger pull, 
Uh, we rarely find that to be uh, the case when we actually measure trigger pull. Things like that can vary uh, as well as change over time depending on the wear and use of the gun. And you also never know if the owner or a previous owner of the gun might have changed out some springs or parts, which would definitely affect the trigger pull. Well, let me stop you right there because you just said that. Do you know if anyone other than Michael Dunn owned that gun? I don't know. Did you ever do a history on the serial number? Uh, that's not my job, and so no, I don't know. Okay, but it's on the gun, correct? I'm sorry? Is the serial number clearly marked on the gun? Yes, it is. And you guys at FDLE have specific computers and technology to track guns, correct? Uh, we don't, we are not the ones who would run a serial number. Well, well, you said it's not your job though, correct? Right, that's so you not didn't, something I would do. You didn't do it? Correct. Okay, and in this case, you, did you ever take the gun apart? Um, no, I don't, I believe I probably field stripped it, took the slide off because I was checking out the safety right. and the problems with the When safety. you field stripped it, did you check to see if the trigger was ever modified, customized, made to be what we call a hair trigger, anything like that? Um, no, I just generally, uh, again, I was looking specifically at how the safety was functioning, but, you know, just generally look at the parts to see if anything does look altered, and this didn't, uh, I didn't notice anything that looked suspicious. Now, you're a, a uh, analyst at FDLE, correct? You're not a technical leader or supervisor, is that true? That's correct. All right, you can go ahead and have a seat. I'm sorry, you can have a seat again. And how many times have you testified as an expert for ballistics and firearms? You said 55 to 60? Yes. Did you just tell this jury that a safety is so you don't have an accidental shooting? Um, the safeties help prevent uh, accidental shootings. Isn't it true there's no such thing as an accidental shooting? It's called a negligent discharge. Isn't that true? If that, I don't know. We usually say accidental shooting. Um, I'm okay with the term negligent discharge too. You've heard of that in your scientific field, isn't that true? Um, actually, I don't recall hearing that term before, but I'm sure it's uh, used. For negligent discharge, meaning an operator's error, the person holding the gun would be negligent in using it. That makes sense. Now, you said you could not eliminate or prove positive your testing. You said you shot into this big thing of water and it couldn't match the gun, correct? With the bullets, correct. I could not uh, identify or eliminate the bullets. And you didn't use the same ammo. You just used ball ammo that you could find in your lab. Isn't that true? Um, no, I believe I used the same type. I used the same type of ammo. You did not use... Um, I used Winchester ammunition and... But I used a full metal jacket and not a jacketed hollow point like the ammo that was here. So the answer to my question is yes, you did not use the same ammo that Correct. you... Correct. Um, I chose to use full metal jacket because when you fire full metal jacket, uh, it stays together nicely, it stays in pristine condition. A lot of times when you fire uh, the jacketed hollow point, they'll expand and that might cover up the marks I want to see. Um, but you usually get the same type of mark. You're typically going to get the same marks right. regardless of which one you use. And you didn't do that. It didn't happen in this case, correct? No, I used the full metal, not the, that jacketed hollow point. But no, you couldn't identify it. You couldn't oh, get correct. the markings and the, the strikings. Correct. correct. I found that neither the, te the test didn't mark well um, as well as the evidence bullets weren't well marked. So there just wasn't much information on the bullets to use to, course, um, to compare to each other to make any kind of conclusion. And isn't it true in your experience that it's actually very common to be able to match bullets through a test fire into this water tank that you use at your office? Yes, we do commonly I identify bullets. And you couldn't in this case, is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. Is there a difference in a sound between a 38 caliber bullet and a nine millimeter, nine millimeter bullet? Um, I believe I would believe you'd probably notice a difference in sound depending on ammunition and different guns and whatnot. There's a ton of different variables, is that correct? That's correct. And is there a difference in sound between a 357 and a 9mm? Again, it would depend on the gun, the bullet, and other variables, whether you're going to have different sounds. And same thing with a 380, you're going to have a different sound depending on the bullet, depending on the factors, depending on the gun. Um, again, though I wouldn't say you'd consistently have the same type of sounds even between the same, type of the same caliber of ammunition. 
same caliber, but from the same gun, you'll have the same sound. Again, it would depend on the, you could have different sounds with different ammunition. No, no, that's not what I, you didn't hear what I said. You would have the same sounds if you had the same gun and same ammunition. Is that um, I would expect that it would probably, the, the report would probably sound the same each time. Right, and different guns with different ammos have different sounds. Is that accurate? I would expect so. Okay. And that, I'm not putting words in your mouth or, or twisting your expertise around, correct? That's a fair and accurate representation? Sure. Now, do bullets make right turns once they're fired? No, they travel in a straight line unless they hit something. Do bullets make left turns after they've been fired? Again, same answer. Okay. Do bullets go up after they've been fired? Same. Do they go down after they've been fired? They are acted upon by gravity, so eventually, yes, they will drop. Oh, well, correct, but gradually. They will yes, gradually. gradually. Right, but they're not going to make a turn down on a diagonal down, correct? N no. Right, and that's a fair, accurate representation of how bullets trajectory work. Is that correct? Yes, I believe so. Okay, and even if it hits an object and ricochets, it's still not, after it ricochets, going to start going right, left, up, or down, correct? Bullets just don't do that in this world. Yes. That would defy the laws of physics, would it not? Yes. Now let me ask you this. When you test fired this gun, even a hollow point is one jacket and one core, correct? Yes, that's correct. And the jacket folds back for the core, is that correct? Yes. Okay. Tell me about a shotgun shell. How many pellets are in a shotgun shell? It varies. Okay. Matter of fact, a 12 gauge could have nine 30 caliber bearings in them, correct? A typical amount of uh, pellets in a 12 gauge, they often have nine pellets, yes. Okay. And that's for what we call double out buck? Okay. Objection. It's irrelevant and outside the scope. Sustained. Well, let me ask you this. Does that have a different sound or different function than just a single bullet, a shotgun bullet? Yes, shotguns would most likely sound different than if you, than a pistol. All right, and they shoot multiple versus just one. Correct. Now, when you said that gun is large or that grip was large to you, was there any modifications to that gun to make it bigger? No. Is there anything done to that gun in your expertise to show to make it more powerful or more deadly? No. More accurate? Not that I'm aware of, no. It's just a regular manufactured gun, no custom work to it, correct? It doesn't appear to have any. Right? No modifications? No, not that I saw. Not even an aftermarket part put on it? Um, again, I'm, I don't know about the grip, if it's an aftermarket grip. Um, I, I'd have to look at it again, but uh, I didn't see anything special that looked different or like it was modified to be uh, more powerful. And if you did, it would have been in your report or you would have just testified to the jury with Ms. Corey, correct? Yes, that's correct. And you didn't do that? Correct. Judge, if I can just have one moment, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Nothing further, Judge. Thank you, Ms. Pagan. Very briefly. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Pagan, despite the sound this gun might make when fired, does it still fire bullets that can kill human beings? Yes. And are there any of the questions that Mr. Strola asked you on cross-exam that in any way prevent the shooter firing this weapon from killing a human being when they aim that gun and fire in the direction of human beings? No. Nothing further, Your Honor. May she be excused? She may. Mr. Strohler. So excuse, Judge. Thank you, ma'am. You're excused. Okay, we approach sidebar. Yes, ma'am.
Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a morning break now. It's a little early, but the next witness is going to be somewhat lengthy.